And uh, welcome back. So we've been bringing you a comprehensive coverage of the Zimbabwean elections and uh, the voters in that country went to the polls yesterday and what has been dubbed an historic election marked by the conspicuous absence of both previous protagonists and political rivals in former President Robert Mugabe and the late MDC tea leader Morgan Swangirai. And as we await the outcome of uh, the election results, let's analyse some of the more pertinent aspects with Senior Research Fellow at Trade Collective, Ms. Lebohang Feko. Thanks for coming through. Thank you, Sakina. So, um, was just uh, reading there in the news that uh, four out of the ten provinces, uh, we've already had results from four of them. Mm. So, it seems as though an outcome is... Inevitable. So inevitable, but also it should be imminent, shouldn't it be? Mm. Uh, considering that it's not such a huge electorate. It's not. And the other thing is, of course, the longer there's a delay, the more that it calls into question credibility. Um, a good election is one that's run quickly, counted fast, um, as accurately as possible, um, and with also with as few gaps in the process as, 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 possibly, as possibly available to the process. Because what that does then, of course, it minimizes the perception that there's been any um, funny business, that ballot box have been either installed, have gone missing, and all that kind of thing. Um, of course, this is not a foolproof method, but we hope that in the next few day or two, we'll be able to have a, a conclusive result. Certainly exciting times ahead. Mm -hmm. But let's just, you know, start by juxtaposing the socioeconomic and the political landscape mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and how those contours have shifted, how they've changed, especially mm -hmm. over the last decade. So it's, you know, the elections have almost become a proxy for some sort of an economic uh, analysis of the country. And people seem to read any election outcome and political outcome in Zimbabwe as strongly linked with the economics. And, you know, what this has, hap what this has done is that it has um, really forced the, the, the policy making and the policy making landscape, not only in Zimbabwe, but in the region, to rethink its own tools. We've never seen anything like this. We've never seen this level of hyperinflation. We've never seen so much currency being printed. We've also never seen a situation where a country is not using its own currency, its own, no, its, its own currency of tender. It has actually been using three currencies as we're aware over the last nine years. Um, the US dollar, the pula to some extent, and predominantly as well the, the South African rand. So all of these things have, have the opportunity to, to really give us new models of how we can think through um, our, own, our own political economics as a region. But Zimbabwe as well, the contours have have changed in that, of course, the productivity levels have been incredibly low. Morale has been very low. The manufacturing and the retail sector have been low. Um, and the, both political parties have made promises that they're going to re-galvanize the agricultural sector for which Zimbabwe was known. Uh, and this, of course, can also be seen as a symbolic act and in an act of also bringing forth some kind of a new renewal and promising that there's going to be greater, greater diversification in the economy. A, an economy that is also working functionally and, and, and optimally brings morale and, and it influences the politic because then you build a spending class, a consumer class. You have goods that are moving fast. You have price control. You have a variety and an access of goods and services. And all of these things play themselves out in the social policy space in different ways. So, you know, the two are interspersed, but I think in the case of Mugabe um, and hmm, Freudian slip. In the case of Zimbabwe, <laughs> they have become um, almost completely difficult to separate from each other. And it's going to be a difficult thing uh, to get right. You know, the economic, I'm not even going to talk about a trajectory because you no. need to start building it from scratch yeah. because there is nothing yeah. at the moment. As you say, this is a country that doesn't even have its own currency. Mm. So if you look at what happened last week, the United States talking about sanctions mm. now, mm. Uh, the United States Senate, the Congress, uh, they passed a bill again with some amendment uh, stating that they will extend sanctions against Zimbabwe unless certain conditions are met. Mm. And um, I went to look at those conditions. They're talking about a free and fair election. Exactly. Uh, they are talking about a return to the rule of law. And this one I thought was particularly interesting. They also talk about the um, military giving uh, being subordinate mm. to civilian to government rule. Mm. So, and that raises a very interesting question. But let's first start by the fact that 
as you said, this is not necessarily, the outcome of this election will not necessarily be a proxy mm. for, you know, a, a prosperity ec economically for Zimbabwe. No, it won't. And, you know, the interesting thing about this is that the it's almost difficult to remember the genesis of the Zimbabwean situation and why there's still sanctions, in fact. I mean, I think many, there, was, there were always two schools of thought around whether sanctions were a way of punishing an individual or, or rather, or if they were a way of forcing the hand of an entire regime, it didn't work. I mean, the individual was incredibly um, resi politically resilient um, and quite stubborn in his approach. And then, of course, the result of that was that instead, um, d different goods and services and human capital flew out of the country. I think that it's, it's, it's quite disgraceful that in 2018, at a time when the country is attempting now to certainly try, you know, charge a new path, that the, the, the whole notion notion of, um, you know, it feeds into the whole notion that Western imperialism is still, is still playing its hand. Uh, I'm also quite surprised, in fact, that the sanctions that the U.S. mentioned did not extend to some kind of a bilateral conditionality in terms of trade agreements, because that is kind of one of the main instruments is trying to force the hand of a particular country so that then they accede to particular trade agreements at their own advantage. And it's sort of, and I think it also gives us the opportunity as African countries and as the region to think through um, bilateral agreements with different countries and to concentrate more on a regional and African-centered form of governance, of democracy, of peace building and economic regionalism. So that then these sorts of, when, when any other region wants to then impose the sort of sanctions that the United Kingdom led um, with, some, with some support from the European Union and the United States and the, and the very hesitant Australia, if I recall, we have our own buttress, which is why if Agreements like the Continental Free Trade Agreement become very important because we're able to absorb these sorts of ravages that have been going through Zimbabwe. Um, and I think that it's also important for us to think through what is our own form of multilateral peace building, um, our, our own multilateral economic agreements in the region. Absolutely. And we'll come back to that question about whether uh, this result, mm. if it goes against the incumbent, will be accepted mm. by those who brought him to power because mm. some have called it a military junta mm. that is in place in Zimbabwe. But let's take a look at uh, what uh, the two uh, main uh, challenges in this uh, presidential election are saying. Nelson Chamisa tweeting that uh, winning resoundingly. We now have results from the majority of the over 10,000 polling stations and we've done exceedingly well awaiting ZEC to perform their constitutional duty to officially announce the people's election results mm. and we are ready to form the next government. There we go. Very, very bullish there from Nelson Chamisa. Mm. And uh, the incumbent president of Zimbabwe, Ed Mnangagwa, he says, well, I urge all as citizens and candidates alike to exercise responsibility and restraint by patiently waiting for ZEC to declare the official outcome. Let us remember that no matter which way we voted, we are all brothers and sisters and this land belongs to all of us. Hmm. So what's your take on that? Look, it's all very conciliatory. Um, my take on this is that... Um, I think that Emerson understands that the ground has shifted. This is the first election where the majority of new voters, the single largest group, are people under the age of 35. Now, 43% of new, new registrations are people under the age of 35. After a period of great apathy, Sikina, where, I mean, quite similar to South Africa, where young people were just so disengaged and disinterested. This also represents a generational change, doesn't it? Not only generational in terms of age, um, with, um, you know, the, the, the MDC leader being, you know, of course, not one of the potentially the youngest heads of state, not only on the continent, but globally, but also a generation away from the whole born free mentality. So people who are not engaged in armed struggle, people who are not part of Chumorenga and who don't feel beholden to those forms of liberation politics, which I think it's useful. It's a useful it's a useful way forward uh, for many countries in the region to watch and learn from. But we'll see what the outcome is. Indeed, we will. Thank you so much for coming through. Thank you. Ms. Um, uh, Lebuhang Peko, who is a senior research fellow at Trade Collective. And as she says, uh, whatever this result will be, it will reverberate through uh, at least Southern Africa and perhaps the whole of the continent. And let's see what sort of changes it will perhaps spark. Well, we're still going to cross to Leanne, who is...